Hello. In today's topic, we're going to talk about time and space complexity and develop a more rigorous way of thinking about how we describe the complexity, the efficiency of a particular piece of code. So, our learning objectives for this video is that you should be able to describe the difference between code modeling and asymptotic analysis, which are the two components of this algorithmic analysis technique that I'll talk about. You'll be able to model a simple piece of code with a function that describes its runtime, and I'll show examples of how that works. And lastly, you'll be able to explain why we can throw away constants when we compute what are called big O bounds and from a, a practical perspective as well as kind of the definitional perspective in terms of what this big O thing means. So our outline for today, we're going to start out with an overview of algorithmic analysis and then talk about the two pieces and finally end with the formal definition of big O. So time and space analysis, as we have talked about at various points already, helps us differentiate between data structures. You may remember this table of the running time of various operations on array lists, singly linked lists, and doubly linked lists. And these were either constant time, they are not dependent on the size of the data, on the number of elements in the list, or linear time, that they require some kind of operation that is searching through the list, that is uh, shifting or copying elements in the case of an array list, but some operation that depends on the amount of data that the list has in terms of the amount of work it has to do. And sort of intuitively, for something like add first, we know that for a, a linked list, that's just changing the first node in the list. And for an array list, that is uh, moving all the elements over to make a new spot uh, at the beginning of the array for the thing we're adding. And those are clearly different. And it's these kind of design decisions that we're going to be taking into account when we're evaluating data structures. We can also think about the space uh, that array lists and singly linked lists take. Array lists have what we would say is zero overhead per element. That we have this internal array and it stores just the data. Kind of no extra information is stored along with each element. We just have an array of the elements, but we may have extra capacity of this internal array that is wasted. In contrast, our linked list has one or two extra references per element. So for every element in our list, we have a next pointer and maybe a previous pointer if it's doubly linked list. And so there's kind of the amount of space required for the elements in our list. And then for each element, some kind of extra stuff. But we only have exactly as many nodes as the elements that we have. We don't have any of this wasted capacity. And while there are these differences, and we can say that if an array list is managed precisely, right, if we have the internal array exactly the size for the data that we're storing, array list is going to use less space, be more space efficient. But in both cases, we'd say these structures take linear space, that the amount of space they take is linear in proportion to the number of elements that they're storing. All right, so this is kind of what we've looked at so far in terms of analyzing data structures. And what we want is a tool that is simple, right? That we're not going to care about tiny differences in implementation. We want the big picture of the differences between data structures. We want something that's mathematically rigorous. So far, I've just been saying constant time or linear time. And today, we're gonna to make this kind of more mathematical so we can be a little more precise. And finally, we want something decisive, something that's going to make it clear how, <clears throat> when we compare data structures, are they in the same category in terms of efficiency or different ones? All right, so here's an overview of this algorithmic analysis process that we're gonna go through today. We're gonna start with the code, some code that we want to analyze, and we're going to go through code modeling to turn this code into a function. And here I'm using function in the mathematical sense, such as a function f, of n equals two times n. And so we're gonna go from this code to a function that describes the amount of work that code has to do. And then we're going to use asymptotic analysis to turn this function into what's called a complexity class, a kind of category that we can put this code in, in terms of 
how much space it takes or how uh, much time it takes. And these complexity classes will match up with the terminology that I've been using so far, uh, constant linear time, uh, quadratic or polynomial time uh, from <clears throat> uh, the iterators topic, uh, first time we saw that. Uh, and so this algorithmic analysis is this overall process of categorizing code into a complexity class, such as linear time. And it's consisting of this code modeling, generating a function, and then asymptotic analysis going from function to complexity class. So what is a complexity class? It's going to be a category of algorithm efficiency that's based on a relationship with the amount of data with or the input size. So if uh, our code is dealing with a list and that list has n elements in it, it's, it's dealing with an input of size n or an amount of data of size n, that's the relationship we're trying to draw between how much work does the code have to do in relation to the amount of input that it's dealing with. And here's a table that relates some of the uh, terminology that uh, we've seen so far to this kind of complexity class notation or this big O notation. So something that is constant we say is O of 1. Something that is linear we say is O of n, right? It's proportional to n in the amount of work that it has to do. Quadratic we've seen is n squared. There are some other common complexity classes. Uh, logarithmic is uh, o of log n, it's proportional to the logarithm of n, uh, log linear, n times log n, uh, and exponential to, to the n, so n is actually in the exponent. And the, if this is describing time, what happens if you double the size of the input? Well, if it's constant, it's unchanged. Uh, if it's logarithmic, it only increases slightly. If it's linear, then if you double the input size, the amount of work you have to do doubles. Uh, once we get up to uh, n squared quadruples and by 2 to the n it's just multiplying drastically and here's a kind of subjective labeling uh, of these different trajectories so we can see that uh, log n and constant uh, increase very slowly in terms of the number of operations required as the number of elements or the input size increases we have o of n it's kind of in the in the fair category and log n is, is bad, but we can deal with it. And typically, anything n squared or, or more is just uh, going to make a, a problem very difficult to solve for any large input. So does complexity really matter? Uh, it, it definitely does. Here is a table where uh, we have a, a number of algorithms of different complexity classes and they all take 100 milliseconds to process 100 elements. Uh, and then this uh, O of n squared or O of n or, or whatever it is describes how uh, that amount of time changes as we increase the size of n. So of course constant, doesn't matter the size of n, always 100 milliseconds. Uh, log n and n, they uh, log n only increases to 175 milliseconds and to 3.2 seconds by the time we get to 3200 elements instead of 100. But you're seeing these higher complexity classes go from 100 milliseconds to uh, close to two minutes, close to an hour, uh, billions upon billions upon billions of years. So we really cannot afford to uh, use algorithms in many cases that are that, that require or that scale uh, as fast uh, in terms of the work they do with input as these higher complexity classes. So uh, this is a, a big reason why this matters and why it's important to understand. All right, so that's the overview of algorithmic analysis. Now let's break down the components involved. First up is code modeling. Uh, and so this is a process, as I said, of mathematically re representing how many operations a piece of code will perform in terms of the input size n. So we're converting from code to uh, some function. So one question you might ask is, well, what is an operation? Uh, we don't actually know the exact time every single operation uh, takes. This depends on a lot of details of the particular system that the code is running on, and we want to operate at a higher level than that in this uh, algorithmic analysis. 
So we're going to make a simplifying assumption that all basic operations take the same time. What do I mean by basic operations? I mean uh, any sort of arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, um, any sort of conditional check equals less than, greater than, uh, assigning a value to a variable is a basic operation, returning a value from a function is a basic operation, retrieving the value of a variable or the value at the index of an array is also going to be a basic operation. Other things our code might do is make a function call. When a function call is made, we're going to just count up the operations in the code for that function, and that is how many operations that function call uh, will take. If we have a conditional, like if uh, x equals equals zero, we'll count that equals equals zero as one operation, and then whatever code is inside that if, we'll count that as well. And for loops, this is uh, an important part, is that we'll count how many iterations, how many times is the loop going to go around, and then it will be that times the total time uh, for the code inside the loop, as well as checking the condition for that loop. So if we do 10 iterations and our loop takes uh, 10 uh, operations for each loop iteration, that's 100 operations total, 10 operations per iteration times 10 iterations. All right. Let's go through an example. We have method one takes an int n, and we'll just go through uh, from the top, counting up these operations. So we said assignment, that's one operation. We have another assignment, that's an operation. Our i less than n, that's a conditional check, that's an operation. So now we have a line of code that's a little more complicated. Let's count up uh, how many steps this is going to take. We have uh, i times three, multiplication, that's one step. We have addition, that's the second step, and then we have assigning uh, the result to sum, that's a third step. So this will be three operations here. Uh, for this i equals i plus one, we're going to have i, the addition will be an operation, and then the assignment will be another operation. And finally, we will have return, return sum, which returns are going to count as one operation themselves. Uh, but we haven't accounted for the fact that there's this while loop, and we may repeat this code some number of times. So let's think about how many times it's going to repeat. Well, i starts at zero, i increases by one each time, and we go until i is equal to n. So this loop is going to go around n times. And so we'll say we have six steps total for our loop times n, the number of times this loop will go around. So I total up all the steps uh, that it would take to go once through the loop, condition check, updating sum, updating i, times n for the number of times the loop will run. And so our function for this code is six times n plus the three steps that are outside our loop. So uh, our kind of mathematical function for modeling this method one, six, n plus, six times n plus three. Okay, let's do another example. This one, a little more complicated. We actually have a nested loop going on here. So let's break down how that's gonna work. Again, we have one for our assignment, another one for assignment, one for our conditional check, one for assigning j to zero, one for comparing j to n, one, uh, two for j mod two equals equals zero. We get two because j mod two is an operation and then the equality check equals equals zero is the second one. Uh, we don't have anything going on in this uh, if, basically for, for simplicity here, uh, our sum equals sum plus i times three plus j. We have four, because we have the three arithmetic operations, i times three, this plus, and the second plus, and then the fourth operation is the assignment. We have two again for uh, a statement like j equals j plus one, two for i equals i plus one, and at the end we have return sum, which is one. But again, we have to uh, account for the loops. So we'll do this inner loop first, where j is starting at zero, it's going until n, it's increasing by one each time. So this is again going to be n steps. So we'll count up the total number of, of steps involved in each iteration of the loop, which will be one plus two is three, plus four is seven, plus two is nine, and that's going to be times n. This loop's going to go around n times. And that's inside this outer loop which is going 
to be one, two, three, four steps in this outer loop plus this inner loop. So that's going to be nine times n plus the four steps outside of the inner loop, again times n. Because we're going to go through the inner loop n times for each time we go through the outer loop. And so our overall function is going to be uh, 9 times n plus 4, that quantity times n for this outer loop, plus the three steps outside of it. So again, our process was to count the operations for every line of code in our method, and then account for the loops by figuring out how many times they're going to repeat and multiplying the steps in there uh, by n. And this can uh, build up as we have loops inside of other loops, we end up kind of multiplying by n uh, multiple times. So that's our code modeling. We've taken a method, turned it into a function in terms of n, uh, and now we want to take those functions and turn them into these complexity classes of O of 1 or constant, O of n, of linear, and, and so on. So let's look at how this is going to work. Uh, check mark, we've done code modeling. And now we're going to focus on step two, this asymptotic analysis. So we have this expression f of n. So how are we going to get this kind of big O of something that we've been talking about uh, so far this topic? Uh, so the first step is going to be find the dominating term and delete all others. And what I mean by the dominating term is the one that's going to be the largest as n gets bigger. Uh, and most of the time when we analyze code in this course, that's going to be the largest power of n. Because as n gets big, the largest power of n, whether it's n squared, n cubed, uh, is going to be the largest uh, term. And then we're going to remove all constant factors. So let me show you what I mean by example. We have this function that we did code modeling for, for method 2, 9n plus 4 times n plus 3. And so if we uh, distribute the n here and multiply it out, we get 9 times n squared plus 4 times n plus 3. And so step 1 here is find the dominating term, like which of these terms, there are 3, 9n squared, 4n, and 3, is going to be the largest as n gets larger. That's going to be n squared, the, the, the highest power of n. So we're going to say this is uh, roughly the same as, as n squared. And then we remove any constant factors, which is everything that doesn't directly involve n. And so we'll get rid of the 9 and say this is about n squared. And this gives us now our complexity class, big O of n squared. So this function, f of n equals 9n squared plus 4n plus 3, is in the complexity class O of n squared um, following this procedure of finding the dominating term, removing any constant factors. So is it okay to throw away all this information? Like we had kind of a bunch of stuff in this function and we stripped it down to O of n squared. And that's because the idea of asymptotic analysis is that we are analyzing the behavior of uh, a code or, or of this function that we've gotten from code modeling as its input as n approaches infinity. So we're saying all right, as our input gets really, really large, how can we describe the behavior of this function? And we only care about what happens when n approaches infinity because for small inputs, uh, for 10, 20, 50 uh, as n, code is basically going to be fast enough. Uh, mo modern computers, they're very fast. Uh, whether uh, if our n is only ever going to be a, a 50 or 100, whether our algorithm is uh, O of n or O of n cubed uh, is rarely going to be important or noticeable. But it's when n gets really large, um, uh, when our data gets really big, that we uh, care a lot more about this sort of analysis. And since we're dealing with what happens when n goes to infinity, these uh, lower order terms, constants, they don't meaningfully add to our final result. And kind of what determines the 
overall kind of big picture behavior of our function is that highest order term. And remember, this is the sort of, this goes along with the kind of goals that we had for this method at the beginning. We want something simple that focuses on the big picture. We're just kind of narrowing in on the most important aspect uh, in terms of the complexity or efficiency of our code. And we also want something decisive uh, that when we compare two pieces of code, we, want, we don't want two complex uh, functions that uh, are hard to tell which of them is, is going to uh, take longer. We're going to boil it down to just the part that describes kind of what happens when n gets really big. And that's going to make this uh, kind of a more decisive approach. So let's convince ourselves that this is actually the right thing to do um, and that when we're kind of grouping functions either into big O of n or big O of 1 or big O of n squared, that this is actually kind of a useful thing to do. So we'll follow that link in the slides to this graphing website where we have a couple of constant functions, O of 1 uh, and uh, Sorry, f of n equals 1 and f of n equals 100. See uh, the, the horizontal black line here at 100 and purple line down there at 1. And then we have two big O of n functions, n and 2n, and then two big O of n squared functions, n squared and 3n squared. And see, as I zoom out, right, as I'm having uh, the input, the... Uh, x value here get larger and larger and larger. See that our two uh, constant functions here are, are kind of grouped together in these low values of, of y and this kind of low amount of, of time that they would take, for example. Our big O of n, our linear functions are in the middle here, and then our quadratic functions, our 2n squared, are uh, very close to the y-axis. They're growing very fast. Uh, we could add another one here. Uh, from uh, that count function that uh, we analyzed in the iterators topic, which was uh, n squared plus n divided by 2. And uh, we can see that, that even though it's divided by this factor of 2, it's very much, you can see the, the red uh, appearing here uh, near the other quadratic functions, it's even though it has both an n and an n squared, it, it looks much more like these n squared than any of the others. So by grouping it into the complexity class of big O of n squared, uh, that's kind of the, the best way to describe at this kind of asymptotic level as, as n approaches infinity, which is kind of where this term asymptotic comes from, uh, that's the best way to describe it. So the last part of this topic is now this kind of formal definition of, of big O. Now, uh, I don't want to dwell too much on this formal definition. Um, it, I'm mostly bringing it up here because if you continue uh, on in, in with CS courses, uh, courses like uh, Algorithms 252 or Computability and Complexity uh, 254, uh, you'll deal much more with formal definitions, so I, I wanted to give you a, a taste of, of that and also mention it so that uh, it's not totally unfamiliar um, should, uh, should you deal with it in the future. Uh, and when kind of computer scientists rigorously analyze uh, code with this sort of ad algorithmic analysis, uh, the formal definition is, is useful. But I want to emphasize that when you are, are analyzing code yourself, uh, it's fine to just rely on your intuition to um, uh, go through that process of finding the, the dominating term and removing constant factors that uh, it isn't necessary to always apply this, this formal definition. But as I said, uh, this formal definition is important um, in computer science in, in general. Uh, and this kind of gets at that. Uh, second goal that we had of a, of a mathematically rigorous approach. So big O is this uh, idea that we want an upper bound on our algorithm's running time, that we only care about what happens when n gets really large, we only care about, uh, we don't care about constant factors. And the sort of intuition here is that we want to 
uh, just have a function g of n that kind of eventually dominates f of n. That it, at some point, it's just g of n is always bigger than f of n. Uh, and that's kind of a good way to put this upper bound on our, on our algorithm's complexity. And this formal definition is that a function f of n is big O g of n, where if f of n is our 9n squared plus 4n plus 3, g of n would be our n squared. So f of n is big O of g of n. If there exists positive numbers that are constant, c and n naught, such that for all, excuse me, such that for all n greater than or equal to n naught, our constant c times our function g of n is greater than f of n. So just to give some intuition for the parts of this definition, uh, why do we involve this constant n naught? Let's think about two functions here. Uh, our first function is uh, 0.01 times n squared. And our second function is just n. So we have quadratic and linear. And because there's this constant factor, 0 0.01, up until we get to n of 100, this linear f, uh, f of n equals n is actually bigger than our 0.01 n squared. And so n naught says, all right, there is some point, there is some amount of input size beyond which this function is, is g of n is bigger than f of n. Uh, and so that's to deal with these cases where we're caring about what happens when n, as n goes to infinity, when n gets really big, and we don't really care about what happens uh, for smaller n. And so n naught is kind of this way in this formal definition to set a point uh, at which below that this relationship doesn't hold because we're only caring about what happens when n gets really large. Uh, why this constant c times uh, g of n? Well, if we want to say uh, that, that f of n, uh, that is 5 times n, is big O of n, that's only true if, we, if there exists some constant c that we can multiply g of n by such that it is greater than or equal to f of n. So this, there exists a positive constant c that we can multiply by our big O function. Uh, that's how we uh, account for dropping out the constant factors from f of n when finding g of n uh, in this definition. All right, so that's what I have to say about time and space complexity. Uh, the big takeaways are uh, this code modeling of counting up the operations, including how we accounted for loops, as well as uh, this asymptotic analysis where we only care about the biggest uh, uh, term in our function. All right, I look forward to your questions.